handheld PC market just keeps on fire, and this time around, we have one of the largest PC vendors, Asus, stepping into this segment for the first time ever with the Windows-based ROG Ally, and powered by AMD's Z1 Extreme APU. Announced on April 1st of this year, much to the surprise of many, there is no doubt excitement for what this could mean for the future of x86-based handhelds, and with it, a potential for a new wave of competitors to enter the space. Now, Asus is no stranger to delivering gaming-focused hardware with their entire republic of gamers brand focused specifically on the category. However, does the experience that Asus have in hardware translate well to their first attempt at a handheld gaming device? I am Rob, the Retro Tech Dad, and I definitely recommend grabbing your favorite snacks and a drink, because this is going to be a long, deep dive into the ROG Ally from Asus. Like we always do, let's start this off with some specs. The Ally comes equipped with the Zen 4 based Ryzen Z1 Extreme processor with 8 cores and 16 threads and a boost up to 5.1 GHz. It features AMD Radeon graphics with RDNA 3 technology and 12 CUs with speeds up to 2.7 GHz. It's equipped with a 7-inch 1920x1080 16.9 IPS display that supports 120Hz refresh rate with a 7ms response time and ASUS claims up to 500 nits of brightness. The Z1 Extreme model is available in only one configuration, which includes 16GB of LP DDR5 RAM, 512GB of NVMe SSD storage using a 2230 form factor, and allows for storage expansion via a microSD slot. The Ally supports the ASUS ROG XG mobile interface for external graphics, a USB Type-C for data, charging, and video out functionality, with support for Wi-Fi 6E 802.11ax and Bluetooth 5.2. Finally, it comes powered with a 40 watt hour 4 cell battery, and it is available now for purchase worldwide in stores and online. The Z1 Extreme Ally is priced at 699 US dollars, 699 British pounds, and 799 euros. Now, I've been pretty excited about the Ally, and I've had my unit pre ordered since the day it was available at Best Buy, and so this will also offer us a look at the ROG Ally from the perspective of a day one retail unit. So let's get into our unboxing and this is a pretty significant package here. Let's take a quick look around and see what Asus has put on the outside. It's a pretty clean box with not a whole lot of identifying marks on it outside of the slick graphic on the front of the box. On the back it does have a brief spec readout so you know what you're getting here. This will obviously be useful when that lower spec model comes out at some point. Alright let's crack this seal open and take a look at the contents of this package. I've got my trusty unboxing tool here to help me out, and this is always a favorite part of mine when you get to tear off that plastic wrapping, leading to such a satisfying sound. Let's quickly take off this ASUS seal and we'll get some more satisfying unboxing sounds. Okay, time to get the cover off and the first thing you will be greeted with is this instruction sheet that is letting you know to plug in the Ally before turning it on for the first time. This is most likely because the Ally is in a shipping state and so it needs that trigger from a power source and you will find that it does in fact have a charge out of the box. You'll notice there's this box on the top and this is where ASUS has stored their, their ROG stand for the Ally. It probably isn't obvious on camera but this isn't exactly a high-end Part, and it feels like it's made from an egg carton package, but I guess it will do the job for now. Okay, time to get the ally out of here, but we will put it aside for a moment as we continue to check out the contents of this package. Let's take a look at what's in the compartment on the left, and it appears we have the power adapter here. This is a pretty substantial power adapter, which is capable of 65 watt charging, so it is understandable. The cable length looks to be of a nice size as well. On the right side of the package, we have a separate box that can be pulled out, so let's check out what's inside this one. And nothing too exciting in here, it looks to be some documentation consisting of some spec information, a warranty card, which is definitely going to be an important difference for this product compared to other Windows handhelds. Okay, let's get this box out of the way and focus back on the main attraction. The Ally is covered in this plastic seal, so let's quickly remove this so we can take a closer look at the product.
First impressions, the Ally feels pretty nice in the hands, and I will obviously hold judgment for comfort until later on when I've had proper usage time with the Ally. Everything seems to be well placed and reachable. I'm definitely noticing that it feels a bit lighter than what I was expecting. So let's quickly take a tour around the device. Starting from the top right, we have our stacked shoulder buttons. The R1 is pressing down nicely, and this is achievable from any point on the button. I do like the texture finishing on the R1 and R2. The R2 are full analog triggers, which are using hull based sensors. Movement is smooth and it has a nice amount of travel, not much resistance so they aren't as stiff but they feel pretty standard to me. Continuing on, we have the power button, which will also double as the fingerprint sensor for security features. Below that we have one of the exhaust vents for the dual fan configuration. Two different indicator lights, one for power and the other for charging. Volume up and down the USB Type-C port and the proprietary ASUS XG mobile port for external graphics, the micro SD slot for storage expansion, 3.5mm headphone port, and below that, the left exhaust vent. And finally on the left side, the same stacked shoulder button configuration. Quickly pressing down and testing for finishing and fit, everything is pressing down nicely from all points and the trigger has the same smooth movement as the right side. Okay, moving down the left side, you can see we have some texture finishing to give the Ally a unique look. I do like the minimal ROG branding on the bottom left. Now on the bottom of the handheld, there is nothing worth noting outside of unit identification and certification markings. Moving towards the right side, and we have the matching ROG branding, as well as the same textured look. And here's a bit of a closer look at the grip texture, which is very subtle, but nice to have. Alright, let's peek at the back of the unit. Here we have the programmable M1 and M2 buttons. Personally, I am not crazy about how these feel, as they feel a bit cheaper than how the rest of the device is set up. You can see two separate intake vents, one of which has been disguised in the ROG logo, which is clever and again highlights some of the minimal branding touches to the device. The same goes for the strip that goes down the middle of the intake vents, which doesn't bother me all that much. Let's go front side and get a closer look here, and let's first check out the Xbox style select button, and then the dedicated command center button, which are both pretty stiff to press down. On, and the full-size analog stick, which are using regular sensors and are not hull-based. These have nice range and movement and click in well. You can see the RGB ring that surrounds it here. You'll also notice how the stick sits above the face of the device. Now the D-pad is interesting. It's a disc-based D-pad, and you might think looking at it that it is similar to an Xbox Series S D-pad, but that is actually further from the truth. I think it resembles more of the Xbox 360 style D-pad, but it is a bit tighter. It's not the worst thing I have felt, but I will reserve judgment of its functionality until a little bit later. I do notice that when pressing down in the center, it's a bit mushy, and so the pivoting isn't as good as I would like. Also, given the expectations of performance with this device, I suspect many will be using this mostly focused on the analog stick. You can see the very minimal branding of ROG on the bottom of the screen bezel. In fact, it's so faint that even the camera is struggling to pick it up. Okay, on the right side, we have the Xbox style start button and then the dedicated button to bring up the Asus Armory crate. First impressions of the face buttons and these are obviously going to be full sized, which is a nice welcome for a handheld device of this size. The buttons seem to press down well enough, but there is some movement in them, which causes them to make a bit more noise when pressing down on them. Now they don't rattle when shaking the device, it's mostly when you're pressing down on it. Taking a look at them from the side and you can see they have a nice amount of travel but they sit exactly flush with the front of the device and you can also probably see some of that movement I was mentioning just a moment before. Moving on, here's a good look at the right analog stick sitting above the face of the unit and I really do love that these are full sized. I also like the texturing on the analog stick cap, and there's also a nice indent for your thumb to rest in the center. So I think now it's time to power on the Ally for the first time, and I unfortunately know what to expect here in this process, as I am very well accustomed to Windows 11, and so I am expecting a bit of an initial setup process here. And now we will fast forward through parts of this as it is time consuming to show on camera, but expect at least 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how fast you can move through the process of Windows 11 setup before making it to the desktop 
for the first time. During the process, you will be selecting things like language, setting up Wi-Fi, and going through any initial Windows updates. For most Windows users, this is a standard experience, but do not expect something that you can turn on and just play immediately. And finally, here we are. Welcome to your Windows 11 desktop on the Ally. This looks to be a pretty clean install of Windows 11 with just the addition of the ASUS software, which will be useful for the Ally. Unfortunately, Windows 11 does come pre-installed with lots of software from Microsoft that for the most part has absolutely no use being here on a Windows handheld, and so you will most likely spend a moment getting rid of a lot of these applications and tweaking Windows to your liking. So let's take a look at the Armory Crate from Asus. At first launch, you will be greeted with a few things, including a brief explanation of the features of the Armory Crate. You can think of Armory Crate as your all-in-one hub, which will also act as your game launcher, and much of it is done automatically. So let's take a look at what's being offered here. We'll head over into the settings tab and here is where we will be able to configure quite a bit, especially as related to this being used as a handheld device. In control mode, you will be able to tweak both the gamepad and desktop modes of the Ally. Personally, I will be leaving these on default for now, but as you can see, there's quite a bit of customization that can be done. In gamepad mode, you can set up key mapping, adjust dead zones for the analog sticks, as well as adjustments to vibration intensity and the analog triggers. A few other things can be accessed here, including your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth settings. You can make adjustments to the RGB lighting around the analog sticks from here, and also turn it off if you desire. Game Visual allows you to select from presets that adjust the display properties for different scenarios such as first-person shooters and racing games. You will notice that to the right we have the Edit Command Center option, and let's actually bring up the Command Center by pressing the dedicated button on the left side. I think for most of us, Command Center will be the most used and probably most important tool for us to be able to make important adjustments to the gaming experience on the fly. And that does seem like the perfect time to now go through what's available to us on the Command Center. The first and most important adjustment many will want to have access to is the ability to change the TDP operating mode on the fly. As standard, ASUS gives us a silent mode, which runs at 10 watts for the APU, 15 watts, which is the performance mode, and finally 25 watts, which is turbo mode, and when plugged in, will run at 30 watts. Beside that setting, there is the option to change your control mode on the fly. Now, auto works pretty well, I have found, but there will be times that you might want to force desktop or gamepad mode when it's not being detected properly. Other situations this might be useful is when you might want to have mouse input in-game, and so being able to switch from gamepad to desktop mode on the fly is a very useful and appreciated ability. Next, we have game profiles, which when you have a game launch will allow you to customize mappings for that specific game. Moving along, we have a quick way to bring up the Windows keyboard as needed. This is another very useful shortcut and one that is much needed in the Windows environment. Additionally, this works great when needed to bring up keyboard shortcuts that many applications already have predefined. Next is the ability to turn on and off the real-time monitoring. And briefly, the real-time monitoring will display the following information. The time, CPU usage, GPU usage, including frequencies for both, the wattage for the APU, frames per second, temperature of the APU, and finally the battery percentage and drain if not on power. So going back to Command Center, we have the ability to set FPS limits as well, ranging from 15, 30, 45, 60, and finally having it set to off. I've personally found this can be a bit finicky, but usually setting the FPS limit you want before launching a game seems to be the best way for this to work reliably. Moving along, Show Desktop is self-explanatory and again useful when you're in-game and need to head back into Windows Desktop quickly without closing the game. Next to that is the ability to turn off the built-in controls of the ROG Ally, which is useful when a game might want to default to that instead of an external controller you might want to use. Beside that, we have the ability to enable system-wide AMD RSR or Radeon Super Resolution, which will allow you to upscale games from a lower resolution to improve performance in-game. This feature only works when the game is obviously set to a lower resolution of the native 1080p. Another thing I really like is the ability to quickly change desktop resolution from 1080p to 720p, and finally, the ability to adjust the refresh rate of the display, which can be adjusted between 60Hz or 120Hz. Now you may notice that I have some additional functionality on my command center, and that is because I've added this back in the edit settings of the Armory Crate, and taking a look here, you can see that we can add or remove as you please and make the command center your own. The command center is easily one of the best and most useful things that comes with the Ally and will tremendously improve your entire gaming experience. Going back to Armory Crate, there's a few other interesting areas in the content section. You will definitely want to head into the game platform section where you can go and link a few of the available storefronts on Windows including Xbox, EA, Steam, Epic Games, Ubisoft, and GOG Galaxy. 
This is a great feature of the Armory Crate, as once you have linked your accounts, any games that you have downloaded will then automatically appear in the Game Library section of the Armory Crate. And in case you wanted to add games or emulators that are not part of these, you are able to do that as well. In fact, you can see that I have added Diablo 4 and the Xbox 360 emulator Xenia to this as an example. And so with that, I think that's a pretty good overview of the Armory Crate and Command Center. But before we move on, I do have some recommendations. Now, I definitely recommend going through a few updates before using Armory Crate and your ally for gaming. There are a few areas to pay attention to when going through any updates. The first area is going into Armory Crate and heading over to the Content tab and then selecting the Update Center. By selecting the Check for Updates in the top right corner, you will be able to see if there are any updates needed for your ally. Out of the box, you will most definitely have some updates available to you, and so make sure to go through and update everything in this section. Now, the next update area isn't as obvious Obvious, and you will want to launch the My Asus tool. If this is your first time launching it, you will be asked to either sign into your Asus account or create one. Once you've done that step, the My Asus tool is actually quite useful and allows you to access information about your specific ally unit, including warranty registration and information. However, a key area is heading into the customer support section and then the live update tab. And here you can check for important system updates available from Asus for the BIOS. Just like the Armory Crate, you will most likely have a few updates to make out of the box. You can also update your AMD drivers from here, which is nice as well. Now, using the device for a bit, there's a few things I've learned along the way to make the experience even better and just to make navigating around Windows a bit easier. The most useful of all has been this graphic that you're seeing on screen right now which details all of the built-in shortcuts defined by ASUS out of the box. Now, there are some really useful ones here, so definitely pause or make a screen capture and save the image to your desktop as a quick reference. I will also have a link to the graphic down in the description box. So let's talk about the build quality of the Ally. And I will say that off the bat, it's obvious we're dealing with a larger manufacturer that has many decades of experience building hardware. ASUS has been around in the PC space as a hardware vendor for a long time, and it does show here with the Ally. This is a nicely built piece of kit. Nothing rattles, finishing is very nice, the details are thoughtful, and overall everything is nicely put together. I did find the programmable buttons on the back to be a little cheap. The unit itself is very rigid and sturdy with really no flexing to speak of. The display also noticeably looks better than some of the others I've seen in this space. The 1080p resolution really allows for things to be very sharp and the 500 nits of brightness really allows the display to get quite bright, but it also scales down nicely so that you can play in a dark environment. The viewing angles are good, colors and contrast are also noticeable improvements over displays like the one on the Steam Deck. Finally, a big importance to the display is that it supports 120Hz as well. The screen is definitely a highlight for the Ally, and a strong one at that. Another surprising highlight is the front firing speakers. Now, ASUS has included 1 watt speakers on each side, and these get pretty loud. In fact, I was very impressed by its performance, especially at the max volume, where audio and vocals still come in very crisp and clear. Here's an audio sample of Jet Set Radio Future running with XMU at maximum volume. Cover Dogen Zaka Hill and graffiti, and flush out those rumors spreading scumbags. So let's mess around a bit with the D-pad, and as I mentioned earlier, it's definitely in an unusual D-pad, and quite different than anything I have really used in the past. Like I said, it's nothing like an Xbox Series D-pad, and then I thought about the Xbox 360 one, and again, not quite the same. However, let's do a quick gameplay test in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and test how it performs in a fighting game. Much to my surprise, it's performing decently here, and I'm definitely able to hit the combo with relative consistency, and so as I said before, it's not the greatest feeling D-pad, but it's nowhere near the worst I've ever used. Finally, I I want to say that the unit is pretty comfortable, however, I did find the Steam Deck to be a bit more comfortable because of its larger, more defined grips. I also didn't like the harsh edges of the unit at the bottom, but weight was noticeably different, making up for some of that especially in regards to long-term gameplay. And speaking of weight, let's get some real measurements here. You can see we have a few friends visiting us here for this video, and they all have one thing in common. They are all what we lovingly refer to as Corpo handhelds, which come to us from big, well-known companies. First up, of course, we have the ROG Ally coming in at 613 grams, or about 1 pound 5 ounces. Next is the Nintendo Switch, and I think it's obvious that this will be the lightest of the bunch, coming in at 14 ounces, or just shy of 400 grams. Then we have the Steam Deck, and this will be the heaviest of the bunch, coming in at 676 grams, or about 1 pound 8 ounces. And finally, the Logitech G Cloud, which comes in at 462 grams, or just barely over 1 pound. 
Now let's size these handhelds up and you can see that the Ally does come in a little bit smaller than the Steam Deck. With the Nintendo Switch then coming in smaller than the Ally, especially in terms of thickness which we will measure shortly. And finally the G Cloud which is also smaller than the Ally and similar to the Switch is also quite a bit lighter and thinner. So I alluded to the fact that I think the Ally uses full size face buttons. So let's measure them and it looks like these do come in at about 10 millimeters, which in fact is the same size as the Xbox Series controller. And just to verify, I happen to have one of them right here. And so let's go ahead and measure the face buttons there. Now here's the Switch Joy-Cons, which are going to be very tiny in comparison, coming in at about seven millimeters. The Steam Deck's face buttons measure in about eight and a half millimeters, which is also smaller than the Ally face buttons. And again, I really do like having the full size face buttons on the Ally. So let's take a look at the thickness of a few of these. And the Ally is definitely a thick device, which makes sense given some of the cooling going on inside of the unit. But the Ally measures in at about 21 millimeters. Now the Steam Deck is a little bit thinner, coming in at 19 millimeters. Finally, let's size up those analog caps and see some of the differences there. The Ally's analog stick is about 16 millimeters in diameter, which is quite similar to the analog cap of the Xbox Series controller. And lastly, the Steam Deck, which is just a little over 15 and a half millimeters. So before we start our next segment, let's take a moment, stretch, and enjoy this doggy break provided by Sunny. We have finally made it to one of my favorite parts, which is tearing down the unit. So let's go ahead and grab our trusty iFixit toolkit and get started. I really appreciate that Asus opted to have the ally with visible and clearly accessible access points instead of hiding them away for the sake of beauty. The ally is using standard screws on the back and there are six holding the back plate in place. So let's quickly speed through this process and remove the six standard screws and get ready to pop the back plate off of the ally. Okay, you will notice that the top portion of the ally will already start to separate a bit and I have found like in many devices that going in with a pry tool or a guitar pick around the shoulder buttons is a good point of separation. There are a few retaining tabs but this is pretty easy to get off and didn't really require much force. One thing I really appreciate is that nothing is wired to that back plate and this is definitely a sign I have been dealing with way too many cheaper handhelds recently. So do not worry about removing the back plate as it is completely free from the rest of the unit. So taking a look at this back plate, unsurprisingly it is a bit flexible. Taking a closer look, you can see the M1 and M2 programmable buttons and how they are designed to function and again I did find this to be a little cheap feeling. I do like that Asus placed a filter behind the intake vents to help minimize the amount of dust that gets caught into the unit. Okay, let's get a closer closer look at the internals of the Ally and get a nice centered shot of it. It's definitely not the prettiest looking device on the inside, but I can appreciate some of the engineering needed to make some of this work, especially with those dual fans. The random strip that connects the left and right side inputs is a bit interesting and kind of cheap looking, but let's get this removed and start making our way down. As always, take care when handling these kind of cables as they are quite delicate. There is an adhesive on the center of that cable which keeps it in place against the battery, so gently lift it up. Now we're going to lift the retaining tabs on each side so that we can free the cable and remove it from the device. Again, take extreme care when lifting those retaining tabs as they are incredibly delicate. Once done, the cable should easily come out. Okay, let's remove this black cover here so we can get access to a few key components. Now you will see something of interest here, and that is the included NVMe, and this is using the 2230 form, but most importantly is how easily accessible this is, which is something I always like to point out in case you want to upgrade to a larger SSD at some future point. Moving along, I will be very clearly voiding my warranty here, so if you plan on going this far, take note as the screws protecting the fan, heatsink, and battery do have stickers over them. I'm a rebel, so I will continue on so we can take a look at some of the other components. With the sticker off, I can now remove the standard screw so it can start to get access to the battery and remove it from the unit. These are smaller screws so you might want to change the bit you are using to get these out. It looks like there are a total of four screws holding the battery in place and with the screws out the battery will lift up pretty easily. There is a cable in place connecting the battery to the mainboard so make sure to disconnect it before pulling the battery out. I recommend disconnecting it from the battery and not from the mainboard connection like I did. By the way, disconnecting the battery will place the device into a suspend mode. This is normal and so when you try to power back on after reassembly, you will need to plug it into a power source first and then everything will work normally again. So let's take a look at this interestingly shaped battery. You can see they had to be clever with the design to get this to fit into the package as is. It's also not a significantly large capacity, coming in at only 40 watt hours, which is identical to the Steam Deck. With the battery removed, you can probably now notice the substantial speakers on each side of the device, and it's obvious why the audio is above average on the Ally. All right, let's continue on and remove this other warranty sticker and then remove the fans and heatsink that are in place here on the Ally. 
This is held in place with four additional screws. And there you go, here's a peek at the copper pipes that help cool things down here. There are thermal pads in place here as well. And finally, before we move on, here's a nice close-up shot of that Z1 Extreme APU. I do have plans to go back in and repaste this with an alternative thermal compound such as the Arctic MX-4, but for this review, I'd like to keep things stock. All right, enough of all this hardware talk. Let's start focusing on gaming and gaming performance. The first thing I like to do with Windows-based handheld is run some synthetic benchmark tools to get an idea on paper what kind of performance we can potentially expect with a device. I also like running the numbers to serve as a reference point for future devices to compare back to. Anyways, let's get things going first with the Geekbench 6 numbers and the Ally running in turbo mode plugged into a power source came back with these numbers. So the Ally in single core performance scored a 2474 and in multi core performance came in at 10647 which is in line with other Z1 Extreme benchmarks. Finally, on the GPU side using 3 Mark Time Spy and also testing max performance based on the Armory Crate's preset turbo mode, the Ally scored 3130 in the overall Time Spy score with a 2823 in graphics and 8198 in the CPU score. Based on these numbers, gaming performance should be quite solid on the Ally and gives us some room to make adjustments based on individual needs. But of course, that is all synthetic and so let's see how this translates into real world performance starting naturally with some PC focused gaming. For all the PC game testing, I am using the defined presets provided by ASUS, as I am assuming that for a majority of users, they will want to simply be able to switch between the presets that are provided to them. First up is a game I've been really getting into recently that was well known for some of its demanding requirements at launch. I am very pleased to say that Returnal does quite well on the Ally. Personally, I have been playing this one using a custom preset of 18 watts using low settings, but the gameplay footage provided here is of that 15 watt performance mode preset. The beautiful thing about the Ally is that we do have some room to tweak quite a bit of the settings and performance features. I have found that for a game like Returnal, which is quite demanding on the GPU side as seen in the overlay, that the little extra power is just enough to smooth things out, but surprisingly the game is pretty performant at that 15 watt setting. I find that performance mode is the best compromise between battery life, temperatures, and performance, and believe me, you will want to keep it at this setting as much as possible if you're trying to extend battery performance. Moving on to another game that is quite demanding, Callisto Protocol is a pretty awesome game from former developers of Dead Space, and again, it's nice to have some headroom here as we can adjust settings to our preference. Gameplay footage here is yet again demonstrating that 15 watt performance mode and the game does well with this keeping locked at 30 frames per second. Finally, another high profile AAA game, and I do love Uncharted, and I am so glad that Sony keeps bringing these games to PC. Anyways, Uncharted 4 provides lots of scaling options, and with the performance scaling of the Ally, we can yet again tailor the experience to the way that we like. For Uncharted, I am keeping it again at that 15 watt performance mode to demonstrate its surprising performance at this setting, and also demonstrate that we do have some headroom for AAA PC gaming, which means that as newer, more demanding games come out, you can scale the power of the APU as needed. I do like seeing this for longevity, which will allow the ally to stay a bit more relevant in terms of hailing those more demanding AAA games. So let's move on to an area that I am quite passionate about, and that is of course emulation. One of the consoles that I am most excited to try on the Ally is PlayStation 3 with RPCS3. Now the Ally's Z1 Extreme APU has support for the AVX 512 instruction set, and therefore RPCS3 performance should really benefit from this addition. The first game we will be testing here is Resogun, and one that has been on the channel before. 
I like to start out with Resogun since it's a lighter game to run and it's something I managed to do even on the Win 600. For Resogun, I am using the 10 watt silent mode preset and the game has absolutely no issues running with this preset. I'll definitely be looking into how low of a power draw we can get away with in the future. However, it's a good sign early on that PlayStation 3 emulation should be really solid on the ally and I think the results will continue to be good. By the way, Resogun is a fantastic and addictive game that is well worth playing on the ally and anywhere else you can enjoy PlayStation 3 games. Next up is Wipeout HD, which is another favorite game of mine, and for this one I've bumped up the preset to the 15 watt performance mode. Now I think Wipeout HD can land somewhere in between 10 to 15 watts, and so in the future I will be setting a custom profile for this. However, using the standard 15 watt preset, this game stays fast and fluid at 60 frames per second. The game looks really great on the ally screen and is quite the showcase for PlayStation 3 emulation. Finally, the game I think that many will want to see running here, and I've set God of War to use that same 15 watt performance mode preset like Wipeout HD. God of War is definitely on the upper end of demanding titles for RPCS3, and at 15 watts, it can't quite hold 60 frames per second, but it is very playable as can be seen by the footage. This game has a lot of shader compilation, so expect hiccups here and there as that takes place over the course of gameplay. However, I specifically wanted to show performance at 15 watts, since again for myself, I find it to be the best balance in terms of performance, temperatures, and battery life. Let's move on to another 7th generation console with the Xbox 360 and using the Xenia Canary build and just like with PlayStation 3 emulation, I'll start out with an easier to run game from the Xbox Live Arcade. Ms. Explosion Man is a hilarious and fun precision based side scrolling platformer and the original game in this series, Explosion Man, also runs really well in the ally. By the way, definitely check out Explosion Man as that game has actually never been ported to the PC. However, Ms. Explosion Man is the one being featured today since I have a bit of a soft spot for that one. I am using the 10 watt silent mode preset and this one unsurprisingly has no issues running using that power profile. So let's check out a great Xbox 360 exclusive from Rare, and this is actually a launch game from the Xbox 360, and we are still using that 10 watt silo mode, and Cameo has no issues running with this preset. I've been really impressed by the performance of Xenia Canary, and it has definitely improved tremendously over the past few months. I have to sometimes take a moment and step back just to realize how amazing it is that this can be done at 10 watts. And finally, let's check out the original Forza Horizon, which to this day is still one of my favorite racing games and a franchise that I absolutely adore on the Xbox. Now, I don't think anyone will be surprised by this, but for Forza Horizon, I did switch to the 15 watt performance mode, and this one does run incredibly well. I am honestly just so happy that I can play the original Forza Horizon on PC, and it still looks and plays so well. It's really a joy to see this, and this game definitely comes highly recommended. For sure, you're gonna wanna give this a try on your ally.
So now we can go back a prior Xbox generation and check out the original Xbox with X Emmy. And I can't think of a better way to start this off than with some Jet Set Radio Future, which to this day remains an original Xbox exclusive and the sequel to the original Jet Set Radio. I absolutely adore this game and to see it running the way it is on the Ally and running as well as it is using that 10 watt silent mode is really something amazing to me. Moving on to another original Xbox exclusive with Dead or Alive 3, and this one was available at launch for the console and just blew me away at the time with its amazingly fast and fluid graphics. Dead or Alive 3 is using the 10 watt silent mode and just like Jet Set Radio Future, has no issues at this setting. And finally, there was just no way I could not show some Halo Combat Evolved, despite it obviously having a port to PC and being part of the Master Chief Collection as well. It just didn't feel right to showcase some Xbox emulation without it. And based on what we've seen already, I don't think it's too unsurprising that Halo has no issues running here using the 10 watt saga mode, and it's just neat to see this happening here with emulation. And I think now is a good time to switch over to the Nintendo side and first check out a platform that is only available to emulate on PC, being the Wii U using the CMU emulator. First up is a game that I always like to check out on CMU. Now Yoshi's Woolly World did get a port to the 3DS, but I do like this version a lot since it is graphically superior to the 3DS one. It's also a game that doesn't really rely on the gamepad and so it's the perfect fit for a device like the Ally. Yoshi's Woolly World is using a 10 watt silent mode setting and outside of the usual shader compilation, the game is is incredibly smooth and plays great. Moving on to one of the few remaining Wii U exclusive titles, and one that is definitely a high profile game. Xenoblade Chronicles X is the spiritual sequel to Xenoblade Chronicles from Wii, and I have to say I was very impressed and a bit surprised that Xenoblade was able to run at full speed with a 10 watt silent mode preset. I think this is a testament to just how good Simu is as an emulator, and I will definitely be checking out some more titles just to see how much of the library is playable at 10 watts. Finally, the last platform to test out, and using Yuzu, you can see that Kirby and the Forgotten Land is doing quite well at the 10 watt preset, which really did surprise me. If you're not familiar with Yuzu, there will be quite a bit of shader compilation initially, so it does tend to cause games to stutter, but eventually it will smooth out, so don't get discouraged if you're trying it out for the first time. Regardless, I thought this one performed quite well at 10 watt. And lastly, Super Mario Odyssey, which has come such a long way in terms of compatibility and performance improvements. I decided to leave the ally at that 10 watt silent mode preset to see just how well Odyssey would handle this setting, and to my surprise, it's doing a lot better than I expected. Now outside of the occasional hiccup, mostly from shader compilation, Odyssey is doing well keeping those frames up at playable speeds. I really do think that high-end emulation is an area that the ally shines in, and it's very impressive to see how much of that is playable at 10 watt. Now I wanted to briefly talk about the 120Hz display and how the Ally can surprisingly handle more of that than one might expect. I decided to use Diablo 4 as a demonstration for this since it's a game that can scale pretty well. So I personally play this game at 15 watts using medium settings and I like to cap the frame rate at 30. 
Again, I do this as a balance between graphical fidelity and battery performance. However, Diablo 4 is a very new game and one that can actually be scaled back to hit a nearly 120 frames per second, which will make full use of the Ally's 120Hz refresh rate. There are many cases where this will be possible. Good examples of games that will make use of that higher refresh rate will be esports titles and slightly older PC games. However, another overlooked area is using the Ally as a streaming device for a more powerful PC that can drive 120 frames easily, which will in turn allow you to make full use of the Ally's great screen. And finally, a cloud service like GeForce Now will also make full use of the Ally's 120Hz panel, and so I just wanted to mention some of those use cases. So now we've come to my battery tests, which I think many already know what we're dealing with here, and it's unfortunately not going to be groundbreaking. The reality is that the Ally, for its use case, has a battery that in my opinion is on the smaller side of capacity and thus just can't realistically drive longer battery life with its power consumption on the higher end. So I ran three individual tests using the ASUS presets of 10 watts, 15 watts, and 25 watts. All battery tests were conducted at 50% brightness, 50% volume with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on. So let's get the worst out of the way and at the 25 watt preset using Returnal as our test game, the battery just barely managed to get over one hour of gameplay at that turbo mode preset. Now thankfully Returnal is a game that is quite playable at a much lower power draw, so I did just turn up a lot of the settings to push the game harder to need that turbo mode. For the 15 watt performance mode preset, Returnal with its setting appropriately adjusted gave us about an additional one hour of extra battery life and ends up just missing that two hour mark of overall battery life. As I said, 15 watts is the setting that I am trying to use to get as close to that two hour target as possible and one that seems to handle most of the higher end AAA games with playable speed. Finally, I decided to load up the Klonoa collection which was ported to PC recently and for the 10 watt silent mode test, I turned the settings all the way up and obviously the game has no issues running at 10 watts, but even at 10 watts we are still under 3 hours of battery life coming in at about 2 hours and 40 minutes. The clear takeaway from this is that battery performance is just not going to be the greatest and you will more often than not find yourself tethered to a power bank or charging your device which by the way takes about one and a half hours to fully charge from zero to 100% using the included 65 watt power adapter. Finally, one last test and taking temperatures after playing a bit of Uncharted, first using the 15 watt performance mode preset, which I find has very solid temperatures. For the surface temperature, I didn't observe anything higher than 42 degrees Celsius and that was directly on the screen. The same can be said for that 25 watt turbo mode where the surface temperature on the screen itself was about 42 degrees Celsius and the rest of the device was staying under that, with the hottest part obviously in the exhaust area reaching about 50 degrees Celsius and demonstrates that the Ally is doing a good job moving heat away from the device and cooling the APU properly. I will note that the APU temperature does get quite high in turbo mode and can easily reach temperatures as hot as 90 degrees Celsius depending on the task. However, for the APU this is considered normal and again surface temperature temperatures are very solid, so the cooling solution in place is doing its job properly. As I mentioned in my teardown, I will definitely be going back now that this video is completed and seeing if a different thermal paste will help bring those temperatures down just a little bit. Now I think it's a given that I have to talk a little bit about the Steam Deck and how it compares to the Ally. Now despite what many believe, these devices are similar and yet in many ways not so similar. They are products with two completely different experiences out of the box and despite both being x86 architecture, one is using a custom Linux based OS with Steam OS and the other using Windows out of the box. I think for some, the Ally is an automatic consideration because it does ship with Windows and that platform does have its fans and many PC gamers are already quite familiar with Windows and some of its benefits and of course shortcomings. Likewise, there are gamers who strictly use the Steam storefront, and so a product like the Steam Deck will probably best serve them. In addition, there are those who do not enjoy tinkering and want things to work as easily as possible, and so the Steam Deck is an excellent consideration. The Steam Deck still remains the best price to performance device with that $399 base model. There is simply not a better deal in the market. However, that is not to discredit the Ally and the Z1 Extreme coming in that $699 price point, which too is very competitive and offers a lot of performance for 
for the money. I think the more appropriate comparison is the highest end Steam Deck at $649 against the Ally at $699. Now for $50 more, you do get a much higher quality display that is brighter, has a higher resolution with 120Hz support. It's a slightly smaller and lighter device with a newer APU in that Z1 Extreme. Battery performance for the two can be pretty similar, with the Steam Deck currently being the better performer at lower TDPs. There are also some things that simply can't be done strictly using SteamOS, and so either you need to load Windows on your Steam Deck or opt for the Windows experience out of the box with a device like the Ally. Realistically, both have their quirks, their uses, and their audiences. And I really do believe that both products have a place in the market and that both are disrupting said market. Now, I really do like the Ally quite a bit. I think one of the most important things that we have gained with Asus and the Ally is the benefit of a large manufacturer entering the Windows handheld space and for the first time ever, a gamer can walk into a mainstream store such as Best Buy and pick one of these units up. Not only that, but many stores have these on display to touch and experience before even needing to commit to a product that you've never held in your hands. Combine that with the benefits of being able to easily return or exchange a unit at a reputable store and suddenly the benefits of having the presence of of Asus becomes increasingly obvious. I think the future is extremely bright, and I do hope that with Asus in the market segment now and the success of the Steam Deck, it will be enough to convince other well-established names to enter the space and try their hand at this. Most important, I hope this is what we need to finally see Microsoft take the prospect of handheld Windows gaming more seriously and finally give us a proper handheld mode to take that experience to the next level, especially for the mainstream gaming audience. With Steam Deck and now with the addition of the Ally, it is exactly the kind of disruption this segment needed and will force many of the Chinese Windows handheld manufacturers to either refocus their products, compete in different areas, and also hopefully drive them to compete in different ways. For Asus and the Ally, I do hope that we see continued support from them as they have been very responsive up to this point, and this is exactly what I want to see and also expect for a product of this magnitude. Time will tell if Asus will continue to devote the same level of commitment in the future, but I do believe the community will also help make this an even better product as time goes on. I think we as gamers, and especially handheld gamers, are incredibly fortunate to have so many great options today, and I can't wait to see what the future will bring in this segment. For myself, I am absolutely enjoying using this for high-end emulation, and I cannot wait to really delve into those topics with future videos, much like I did with the Win 600. I'll be back pretty soon with some more coverage of the Ally, and until then, I hope you enjoyed this very lengthy look at the ROG Ally. I am the Retro Tech Dad, and I thank you so much for watching.